Hey everyone, welcome back to Medition, your trusted medical information channel. I'm Dr. Lin, a board certified allergist and immunologist. Today, we're talking about one of the cornerstone treatments for chronic hives, also known as chronic spontaneous urticaria. For years, the main option for patients who remain symptomatic despite antihistamines was biologic injections. Zolder was first approved in 2014, and earlier this year, Dupixin was added as another injectable therapy for chronic hives. Both are effective, but they all come in injection form. In previous episodes, I covered both Zolder and Dupixin in detail. If you have not seen those yet, be sure to check them out. They are linked above and in the description below. Now, the landscape has changed. This week, the FDA approved Rapsido, the first-in-class oral BDK inhibitor for chronic spontaneous urticaria. For patients who continue to struggle with hives and itching despite antihistamines, Rapsido opened up a brand new pathway and importantly, a pill instead of an injection. So let's go through the five most important things every patient and caregiver should know about Repsido. And if you're new here, don't forget to like, subscribe for more science-based medical updates. Now, let's dive in. First, what exactly is Repsido and who is for? Repsido or Remibrutinib is approved for adults with chronic spontaneous urticaria who remain symptomatic despite high doses of antihistamines. Chronic spontaneous urticaria is marked by persistent hives, itching, and sometimes swelling that can last for months or even years, often without a clear trigger. For many patients, antihistamines alone are just not enough. Until now, the next step meant injectable biologics like Zolir or Dupixit. With its approval in September 2025, Repsidol changes that. It is the first-in-class oral medication, giving patients a targeted non-injectable options for disease control. Second, how does Repsidol work? Repsidol is an oral small molecule drug that blocks a protein called Bruton's tyrosine kinase, or BTK. This protein is found in many immune cells including mast cells, basal fields, B cells, macrophages, and even platelets, where it helps regulate signaling. In chronic hives, mast cells and basal fields are the most important, since they release histamines and other chemicals that cause redness, itching, and swelling. When these cells are activated, BTK acts like a switch that flips on and triggers the release of histamine. By blocking BTK, Repsido turned down the signaling and prevent mast cells and basal fields from spilling out histamines in the first place. Put simply, Repsido works earlier in the pathway than antihistamines, stopping the reaction before histamine is even released. Third, let's talk about dosing and administration. The recommended dose for Repsido is 25 mg twice a day. It comes as a tablet that can be taken with or without food. But it should be swallowed whole with water. Do not split, crush, or chew the tablet. If you miss a dose, just skip it and take your next tablet at the regular time. Do not take extra doses to make up for the one you missed. Because Repsidol drug levels in the body increase in patients with liver problems. It should be avoided in patients with mild, moderate, or severe liver impairment. Fourth, let's talk about drug interactions. Repsido is mainly broken down in the body by an enzyme called CYP3A4, and some medicines can interfere with this process. If it's taken with moderate or strong CYP3A4 inhibitors, such as certain antifungals or antibiotics, Repsido levels can rise too high and increase the chance of side effects. If it's taken with moderate or strong CYP3A4 inducers, 
like some seizure medications, rapsidol levels can drop too low and make the drug less effective. Because of this risk, rapsidol should not be taken with either CYP3A4 inhibitors or inducers. Rapsidol also inhibits a protein pump called P-glycoprotein, or PGP, which can raise the levels of drugs that rely on this pump to move in and out of cells. For some medicines, even small increase in drug levels may cause serious side effects. One example is digoxin, a heart medication. If you're taking digoxin or other PGP substrate medications while on Repsidol, your doctor may need to monitor you more closely for adverse reactions. In addition, Repsidol may increase the risk of bleeding when used with blood thinners or other antithrombotic medicines. If both are necessary, your healthcare provider will carefully weigh the benefit and risk and monitor for signs and symptoms of bleeding. That's why it's essential to share a complete list of all your prescription medicines, over-the-counter products, and supplements with your healthcare provider before starting Repsidol. And finally, let's review side effects and safety. In clinical trials, Repsidol was generally well tolerated. The most common side effects were nasopharyngitis, headache, nausea, abdominal pain, and bleeding. For most of this, the percentage were only slightly higher than in the placebo group. While the drug numbers may look larger in the Repsidol arm, that's because patients were randomized in a two to one ratio to receive Repsidol versus placebo. That's why it's more accurate to compare percentage rather than absolute numbers. For example, nasal pharyngitis, meaning nasal and throat symptoms, such as nasal congestions, runny nose, or sore throat, resulting from infections, allergies, or other causes, occurred in 11% of patients on Repsidol compared to 9% on placebo. The most notable finding was bleeding. In the pivotal trial, bleeding events mainly involving the skin and mucous membranes occurred in about 9% of patients on Repsidol compared to 2% on placebo. These include bruising, petechiae, which means small red or purple spots on the skin, nose bleeds, gum bleeding, blood in the urine, and menstrual related bleeding. The most common were petechiae, seen in about 4% of patients, and bruising, seen in about 2%. Importantly, no severe bleeding events were reported, and there was no link to low platelet counts. About 0.5% of patients discontinued Repsidol due to bleeding, compared to none on placebo. Because of this, bleeding is an important consideration with Repsidol. The risk is higher if you're also taking blood thinners or other antithrombotic medicines. In clinical studies, anticoagulants were not allowed, although low-dose aspirin up to 100 mg daily or clopidogrel up to 75 mg daily was permitted. Your healthcare provider may monitor you closely and stop treatment if bleeding develops. It's especially important to watch for warning signs such as unusual bruising, red or purple skin marks, pink or brown urine, red or black stools, headache, dizziness, confusions, or feeling unusually weak. If any of this occur, contact your healthcare provider or seek medical attention right away. If you have had recent surgery or are planning one, your doctor may recommend stopping Repsidol for at least three to seven days before and after the procedure to reduce bleeding risk. And one more important point, life or life attenuated vaccines should be avoided doing treatment with Repsidol, since their safety and effectiveness in these settings are not known. And there you have it, five essential facts about Repsidol, the first in class 
oral BTK inhibitor for chronic spontaneous urticaria. It's approved for adults who remain symptomatic despite antihistamines. It works by blocking mast cell and basal field activation along a key pathway. It's taken as a twice daily oral tablet with important drug interaction considerations. And it has shown a favorable safety profile when appropriately monitored. For patients living with chronic hives, Rapsidol introduced a long awaited oral treatment option, bringing targeted relief without injections and the potential for long term control. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share your thoughts or experience in the comments below. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more evidence-based medical insights right here on Medition. See you next time.